Welcome at the Andere Krant. Today we have a very special guest. Meredith Miller is an expert in helping people recover from trauma and abusive relationships. And from that experience, she has unique insights in the mass psychological processes that are currently taking place. I saw her expert testimony at the Corona Auschwitz, the grand jury of Rainer Vollmich, and became very interested to learn more. In this interview, we will explore the psychological dynamics in society after two years of societal upheaval and what the possible areas for healing and recovery are. Meredith, welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me. So from your personal experience, you have a lot of um, uh, yeah, knowledge and experience about abusive dynamics in, in systems, in family systems, in organizations, so on a smaller scale. But you also saw those same dynamics playing out on a societal level. Can you explain that? So it's very interesting that the same patterns appear from the micro, the interpersonal relationship and the smaller family systems or workplaces and groups of people to the greater macro uh, vision in society. What we see is an abuse cycle that goes mm -hmm. back and forth between chaos and calm. And this abuse cycle escalates over time. So it increases in intensity and in severity over time. And probably a lot of people can recognize that we've been through this cycle multiple times since mm -hmm. 2020. Um, and so what we see too are the very, the similar dynamics, the abusive, the psychologically abusive dynamics that are used in interpersonal relationships as we're seeing now in society. And we see the same coping mechanisms that the individual has, our survival mechanisms that are actually built into the human brain and nervous system to survive such an experience. And so we see the same, the same effects on the individual in relationships and family systems and whatnot that we're seeing in society nowadays. So what made you recognize that it was an abusive relationship? At what point was that very clear to you? When it stopped making sense. You know, I think at first, in early 2020, everybody was cautious. Nobody really knew what was going on. There was limited information. But then around the end of March of 2020, a bunch of doctors started coming forth and scientists pointing mm -hmm. out that, you know, the reaction to what was happening it does not equal, you know, the actual danger of what's happening. And that mm -hmm. was when I started opening my eyes more. And I got out of that fear because I had also fallen into the fear, which is a very highly uh, effective weapon of psychological warfare. When you can mm -hmm. get a person to feel terrified, it causes the nervous system to go into those coping mechanisms. So I pulled myself out and I started really looking at the messaging that was coming across through the media. I saw all the corporations getting on board and there was a coordinated response that was sort of copied and pasted all mm -hmm. across society. And I started to see the same patterns of abuse that were taking place on the macro scale that we see on the micro scale. So I saw my own cognitive dissonance. You know, it took me almost a month to get out of the cognitive dissonance, which is what's caused when we go through that abuse cycle, when we're being presented with information that's contradictory. It's mm -hmm. very stressful for the mind to be able to reconcile those two opposite beliefs. Mm -hmm. What we're being told and what we're seeing, for example, as well, it almost creates a short circuit in the mind that results in denial and defensiveness. So mm -hmm. once, once we can get out of the cognitive dissonance, then we can start to see more clearly what's going on. And I think that's actually the biggest struggle that most people have been having is the cognitive yes. dissonance. You know, we, we want to believe that our governments want the best for us and want, you know, the well-being of their citizens. But at the same time, we're seeing evidence of the contrary. So it's mm -hmm. very difficult to resolve that inner conflict. So what makes people get out of their cognitive dissonance? Facing the truth. So once a person has gone through a trauma in general, but in this mm -hmm. case, we're talking about a relational trauma, the kinds of trauma that take place between human beings through our relationships, again, whether it's micro or macro relationships, it has the same effect. So the very foundation of healing after these kinds of traumas is facing the truth and getting a sense of safety. 
So initially, when a person starts to discover something's wrong, something's off, it seems to be abuse going on, they start Mm -hmm. relentlessly seeking truth. So maybe a lot of people can relate to they started discovering something was weird and they started doing all this research online and trying to find information. That's Mm -hmm. also what an abuse victim does. They start to look for keywords online. They start to do research. They start to try to figure out what is the truth. And the tricky thing is the abuser, the perpetrator, never admits the truth. No. So this is something we have to find for ourselves. And that relentless facing of the truth eventually dissolves the cognitive dissonance. But it's a challenging process. But here there's a tricky thing as well, because I noticed that for pe- for the people who still believe the government and the mass media, f- their fear is the virus. But for the people who started realizing hmm, this is really off, they're lying to us and well, all the other things that we won't go into right now. But that um, that knowledge by itself, I n- notice sometimes can even be traumatic. Like it almost triggers more fear than than the, the virus. So, yeah, fear of tyranny, and so yeah. both sides are, are having that fear, the paralyzing fear. One side is afraid of the virus and people who they've seen as dangerous vectors of that virus, and the other side, we're afraid of tyranny and what we're mm-hmm. actually seeing and, and wanting to see the truth at the same time, feeling the fear about that. Mm-hmm. So, what do you do to manage that kind of fear? So relentlessly facing it over and over again. So for example, in an abusive relationship, I recommend that a person write down what's called a sobriety list, meaning Mm -hmm. keeping your brain and your mind in the sobriety of the truth. So if it's an interpersonal relationship, they're going to write down all of the abusive, awful things that that person did. And when their mind wants to go to the good, think back to the good times or go to the wishful thinking that things are going to change and be okay, they read this list and it kind of jars the mind into a state of sobriety again, getting out of the denial and the defense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're seeing in society, it's good to face those truths. And the challenge is that the brain wants to delete all the bad stuff. So we're working against our actual biology and things that are built into the human nervous system. So it takes time to do that. And another important thing is to speak the truth. Because as Mm -hmm. we speak the truth, we find allies. Mm -hmm. This is the same for a victim coming out of an abusive relationship as well as in society. The more we talk about it, very quickly we're going to find out who are our allies and who are Mm -hmm. not. And that sense of like connection is so important for a sense of safety because we are mammals and our nervous Mm -hmm. system was wired to seek safety in social connection. And so it's terrifying in some ways because we're being told that, you know, we can't participate in society. You know, we're seeing as the enemy if we're challenging the narrative. But then Mm -hmm. when we speak the truth and we find those who see similar things, there's a certain relief that takes place. There's a certain sense of calmness that happens in the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that helps us start to get past that fear. You know, the fear of the life threat, because the nervous system is now sensing life threat. Yes. So the sense of connection is really essential. Absolutely. And so to get back to this cognitive dissonance, because I wrote about this uh, in in my email, (laughs) because to me, like here in the Netherlands, everything appears to be back to normal. So there's no more masks. There is no testing requirements. We don't have to show our passes to sit on a terrace. Um, But I realized in myself this kind of uneasy feeling. And when I thought about it, why does this make me feel so uneasy? I thought after everything that has happened, like we've been locked up in our homes, uh, neighbors have been encouraged to snitch on each other. We've been coerced in experimental gene tech tech vaccinations. Um, The school of my daughter has been locked for ages. Uh, We've been forced to wear facial coverings. Well, you know, all these things. And I thought after everything that has happened to go back and act as if everything is normal and nothing had happened. I thought, I don't know what I expected, but this to me is like the most insane response possible. Um, Yeah. So how do you explain that? So this is actually what happens is your nervous system 
at a level we're not consciously aware of, your nervous system is always scanning the environment for cues of safety and threat. Mm -hmm. So the nervous system has now experienced this pattern over two and a half years, and it's starting to recognize the pattern. So when we're in this temporary perceived time of calm, because it's relatively calm now, you know, mm -hmm. the, the moments when it felt most chaotic and scary, the nervous system already senses that that cycle is coming around again. It senses that the calm before the chaos, and so therefore the chaos is coming. So a lot of people might be sensing a generalized anxiety a sense mm -hmm. of dread, like something feels like something bad is going to happen. Um, and the challenge is that when we're in the phase of calm, when things appear to be okay, it's almost like anesthesia in the body, in our alert system. So it kind of tries to get people to relax and, and not see that it's not over, that it's going to mm -hmm. keep repeating and it's going to get worse. So that's for the people who see what is happening, but for the people who don't see it, like the cognitive dissonance is really that, that strong? It's incredible because it's it's the intermittent reinforcement. So part of the Stockholm syndrome, there's the isolation, there's the perceived act of kindness. So mm -hmm. when the perpetrator does an act of kindness, it's it's like a numbing, it's like an opioid in the brain that calms the nervous system and gets the person to see the good in the perpetrator and to think that, oh, we're going back to normal, everything's going to be okay. But that intermittent reinforcement, also what it does is it causes a person to become almost obsessed with compliance for the mm -hmm. hope of getting that next reward that's going to come. So they become obsessed with complying, even as the rules and, and things get more and more absurd and more mm -hmm. ridiculous over time. So for the people that are so complying and still believing the narrative, this is really like a mass Stockholm syndrome. 100%. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so there's four parameters of the Stockholm syndrome. The Stockholm syndrome takes place between strangers, people who don't know each other. It came from a bank heist, a captivity situation a long time ago where psychologists figured this out. When we're talking about interpersonal relationships and people know each other, we call it a trauma bond, but it's mm -hmm. the same survival mechanisms. So one is the isolation. The perpetrator always has to isolate the target from outside perspective. So it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be physical isolation, but it can be. So we've seen people locked at home in domestic confinement, but we've also seen this isolation from outside perspective. So the censorship, the propaganda, the silencing and smearing of any voices who say anything that contradicts the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so people are always connected to their technological devices. So they're always connected to the voice of the perpetrator, to the narrative of the perpetrator. So that's the isolation. Then there's that cognitive dissonance that happens from the perceived act of kindness, which I mentioned where, you know, they give you a free vaccine and the government tells you we care about you and it's for your safety, you know, and there's all these promises, even bribes to get the vaccine and whatnot. Um, and even like forbearance of student loans or home mortgages in our country, we had these. So all these acts of kindness are very con confusing for people. Then there's the perceived life threat. And so as the situation goes on over a period of time, and as I mentioned, the nervous system starts to sense a life threat in the environment that starts to create a collapse inside mm -hmm. the person. So the autonomic nervous system collapses and the person goes into a state of dissociation or freeze. So when they're, when they're in this state, they become extremely compliant. It's very difficult for them to get out of that state. And mm -hmm. they almost, they start to become, you know, as if like actually even your autoimmune system starts to shut down, your metabolic system starts to shut down. So we're in a pandemic and this fear terror from all the shock trauma and the imagery that people have seen is, is causing their immunity to go down. Mm -hmm. So that's really not good. And, and this makes the control even more, more easy. And so then we go into the perceived inability to escape. So it's isolation, perceived act of kindness, perceived life threat, and perceived inability to escape. So you can escape, perhaps, if you're in an abusive relationship, you could walk out the door, and most people walk out the door multiple times a day to go to work, to go to school with their kids, to do life. But they go mm -hmm. back home because their nervous system is in such a state of learned helplessness that they're telling themselves they can't get out. They become so dependent on the perpetrator that they believe they can't survive 
or they don't see the end of that situation. And so, you know, when we're looking at what's happening in the world, it seems like there's no end. It seems like there's no real going back to normal. So what do people do in that state is they go to escapism. So they go to alcohol, drugs, self-harm, pornography, you know, all the things that are greatly increasing since 2020, Mm -hmm. because people are just looking for a way to cope since they don't see a way out. So it's it's very complicated to get out of this state of Mm -hmm. learned helplessness, which is the final result of the Stockholm syndrome. So what does it take for people to snap out of that? It's the truth and safety is the foundation. So like I said, searching for the truth online, talking to people about the truth and finding allies, starting to build a sense of safety, taking whatever Mm -hmm. precautions that you can in your life, setting boundaries with people who feel unsafe, you know, people who are Mm -hmm. advocating for something bad to happen to you or for your apartheid from society. These are not allies. These are not people Mm -hmm. to have close. Your your nervous system is not going to feel safe being around people like that, you know, and then unsubscribing from the abuser's narrative. So even if we're kind of aware of what's going on, if we're still going to those sources of mainstream media, social media, and our brain and nervous system is constantly subjected to that, it's hard to unsubscribe from Mm -hmm. that narrative. So it's good to look for alternative sources of information that a person finds more reliable, that resonates more, and building that sense of community which Mm -hmm. I think is one of the most important things right now so that one, we feel the safety of the connection, which is so healing and it helps us get out of that neurological collapse because Mm -hmm. when we're in, when we're in that state of consciousness, we don't have access to our higher consciousness, our intellect, our creative thinking, our critical thinking, our ability to imagine and have insights and intuition we need those faculties of our brain and mind in order to be able to do something, you know, to build a new future, to fully unsubscribe from what's going on. So that's mm-hmm. very important. So there's a step before, like before somebody starts to look for the truth and start searching and looks for connection for people who are searching too, there, what is the moment what leads to the moment that somebody thinks starts looking for the truth that they think, Hey, there's something off with this. Like, is there, yeah, is there a recipe for it or is it what something I found, that leads to that? I'm sorry. What I found is it's okay. What I found is it's called, uh, I call it a disruptive moment of truth. And so you're going through your life and something spontaneously happens. You're either exposed to some information or you have your own experience. And for some people I've heard recently, they, they were completely asleep all this time, but all of a sudden they had a bad reaction to the experimental drug. And all of a sudden now they woke up because it affected them personally. But something spontaneous happens and it shatters your reality. And from that moment, you can't unsee what you just saw. Then there's mm-hmm. still the dissolution of the cognitive dissonance, right? That will need to take place. But it, there's a spontaneous moment, almost an act of God that happens that kind of shocks the person out of that state of reality that they were living in. And basically it's a confrontation with reality from a fantasy into a reality. Yeah. I've been wondering about like about the vaccinations, but also the gas prices and uh, the inflation that I think if you don't have any money anymore in your bank, then, then that becomes very, yeah. So I've been wondering about what are the things that can, can deliver reality check. And that's what happens in an abusive relationship is eventually you have that moment that's suddenly reality shattering because things escalate and get worse and worse. And that's what we're seeing in society, the inflation, the gas prices, the food prices, the shortages, Mm -hmm. all of this is going to keep escalating. And that's where it gives people the greatest opportunity to wake Mm -hmm. up, to see that something is wrong. And none of us really knows the whole truth. And so I think a lot of people maybe get desperate because they feel like, well, they don't they don't know what's really true. None of us really knows. But really, the first sign of abuse is that sense that something's wrong, something's off. And it's very hard to put your finger on what's going on, because, again, the perpetrator never tells you the truth. They never admit what they're doing. But when you have that sense that something is wrong, that's what leads you in the direction of seeking truth. Mm hmm. So what are hallmarks of a re- abusive relationship? 
So when, yeah, when is it healthy and when, what, what are the hallmarks, like, for example, with the government, like, that, that's, it is abusive? Like, the control of information is a huge red flag. So you'll see that in an interpersonal relationship where the abuser will start to smear other people in the target's life. You know, friends or family members, they'll tell you that well, they said something bad about you or, you know, they're not good for you or you're better than them. And this person really loves you and you can't trust anybody else. So here we have society and we have the media telling us you can't do your own independent research. You're not smart enough for that. Just trust us. You know, we, we have the truth. And then we see social media and we have fact checking, which is a censorship of truth. And no, no, trust us and only trust these sources. That for me is the biggest red flag of what's going on is, again, that how the abuser has to control the reality to isolate the victim from any kind of outside perspective. And then there will always be the smear campaigns of the people who try to speak the truth. The same thing will happen in a family system, for example, or a workplace to the person who stands up and speaks the truth. Everybody will target that person because the abusive system, whether a family, a workplace and society is formed by abusers and enablers. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that's really hard for us to see sometimes is that we can be enablers when we do the bidding of the abusers or when we see what they're doing and we turn the other way. And that's the part I think in history that's often left out. Like many times before there have been totalitarian and tyrannical things that have happened. But if we look at the most known one, which is Germany, you know, mm -hmm. World War II, like during the 1930s, people were seeing, you know, there was a, an apartheid happening in society and then eventually people were disappearing and people were turning away. They didn't want to look at it. They didn't want to look into it. They became enablers. And when we see the documentaries about World War II and what happened and everything, this is one topic that's not talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most important things for us to realize that we're either going to be enablers of that system or we're going to stand up and, and stop subscribing to that and start speaking the truth instead of going along with that system because then we end up participating in that evil. I think it's very interesting that you say that because I have a list of a number of Holocaust survivors like who've really been in the camps and they all say in their own words something like the, the worst is to be a bystander. Like the, the perpetrators, they are not, nowhere if, if the bystanders don't participate. Exactly. Um, the enablers they, maintain that system. Yes. And as you say, they participate in this evil because it is evil. Um, and but that also, yeah, that brings me to my next question. So in this whole time, I've thoroughly resisted the apartheid maatschappij that they uh, society. Sorry, that's a Dutch word that they try to implement. And I notice now that I feel some apprehension where it's like even everything seems normal again i think okay if there's another speech on the television you will be masked again i'll be shut out of society so i notice that i really uh, pull towards people who have kept their back straight in the last two years and i feel a bit uneasy about the others and that again makes me feel uneasy because i think i i I would like society to be whole and not split like this. So this this is something I've been thinking about a lot also in terms of, yeah, what does it take for this kind of rift to heal again? I think it's going to be a much bigger conflict and disaster that's going to take place mm -hmm. in order for there to eventually be a unification of society. Because like you said, it's just, it's one speech away from the next level of whatever the next level of apartheid or abuse is going to take place. And so because people have already been primed and programmed, you know, very eventually it's going to escalate. You know, at one point they're calling and reporting neighbors, it's going to get worse. And mm -hmm. so, of course, your nervous system senses an apprehension because you've already seen people's true colors. If anything, the last couple of years have revealed what our true values are, you know, mm -hmm. and even for the people who are aware and maybe in private, they're talking to you about what's going on, but in public, they're acting like not, it doesn't feel safe because you see that person is more concerned with self-preservation than the truth, than what's right. 
because they don't want to be the target of other people saying things about them or losing income or whatever consequences will come for speaking the truth. So your nervous system is feeling unsafe around these people because they've already showed you where they stand. Mm -hmm. And so the next time they're told what to do, you can almost expect that they'll comply. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they'll participate in implementing the system and it's not going in a good direction. Correct. That's why boundaries are important. So as I said, you know, when you speak your truth, you're going to find out really quickly who your allies are. That's your community. And it's good to have boundaries with the enablers of that system, because Mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time before that becomes cannibalism. That is what happens in an abusive system is it destroys itself by destroying everyone in it. So if you think about healing, then obviously... There is something in those people that needs to happen by themselves. And once they have their lucid moment, then we can be there to help. But in the meantime, what are things that we can do to um, yeah, to maintain our own balance, but also work towards a healthier society? So I recommend the personal trauma healing. Everybody has traumas from their life. A lot of times we don't even recognize what something was a trauma, particularly in childhood, developmental traumas that take place. And something a lot of people are starting to notice is in the last couple of years of all this collective trauma, our own unresolved prior to 2020 personal traumas are coming up to the surface. And so mm-hmm. as each of us takes responsibility to process and to integrate our own traumas, that's our own healing. But then as more individuals participate in this, we are creating and participating in a healing society. And so what's happening now is a lot more traumas are happening to us. Obviously, the children are going to be most affected because in their developmental years, their nervous system is being subjected to this trauma. If they don't have the proper trauma healing, they're going to have a lifetime of post-traumatic stress symptoms. That's going to keep getting passed on from generation to generation, just like all of the prior collective traumas that were never really integrated or healed. So how do we how do we heal that trauma? It's a lot like processing the grief. It's about allowing those feelings to come up to the surface and feeling them and processing them and extracting the wisdom and the insights from them into our life so that mm-hmm. we can move forward. And so it's really important to allow ourselves to feel because the trauma gets frozen in the nervous system and it causes health problems. It causes a lot of issues in the body if we don't allow it to come up. And that's really challenging. So do you think that, of course, this has been like a mass manipulation with an enormous amount of technology? And to my, like if how I research it, it's been quite deliberate. Um, But also it's about like an abuser and a victim relationship. Is all this like unresolved past trauma, does it make you more vulnerable to sort of comply in this type of relationship or is this something that can happen to anyone? Mostly it's going to happen to the people with unresolved trauma. So if a person has been through the trauma and they've worked on healing and they're working on healing, some kinds of trauma are a lifetime of process. It's not like suddenly it's gone one day. But if a person is in that process of working on their healing, they're a lot more likely to recognize it almost gives you an immunity to that Mm -hmm. kind of abuse and manipulation. But if a person has not been doing that work and they've been through these traumas, then those neurological coping mechanisms and survival mechanisms kick in without our awareness. Mm -hmm. And so that causes a person to continue through that cycle. Okay, so basically it's like working on our own stuff and it makes us stronger and and like the real inner strength um, will help us to resist these these big societal upheavals. Exactly. And as more of us do that, we heal ourselves because it's it's an individual has to take responsibility for themselves. Right. And I think that's the challenge. Once you've been victimized. A person is generally looking for someone outside to save them, to rescue them from the situation or their life. But we have to do it for ourselves. And so as each of us takes responsibility for ourselves, we're contributing to a healing world. I find it very interesting that you say that because I noticed that uh, there are a lot of um, 
um, sort of, how do you say it? Like also camps in the alternative media that look at like QAnon is going to save us or aliens or some spiritual force. Um, but or and, and then the people that are in the mass media I know that the government is taking care of this, but in each each and every time. So to me, like I have this, how do you call it, a litmus test where I think, okay, if if it's um, an approach that tells you like get into your own creativity and does this empower you? And I think, okay, then then it's fine. But there are so many approaches that really try to disempower you and it's actually not just the mass media correct and you're right the word is empowerment empowerment comes with self-responsibility and that's actually the shift from the victim state into the survivor and eventually a thriving in life is taking the self-responsibility that's where our empowerment is some people Mm -hmm. and I saw this over the years working with abuse victims when they find out about the abuse and they can identify the abuser they often get stuck in that blame. And it's not that the blame is wrong. The blame is right. You know, the abuser needs to be responsible for what they did, but they get stuck in the external truth of that and Mm -hmm. not directing inward. And so we'll also see the camps where people are focused on healing the world. That's a form of spiritual bypassing. It's not dealing with our own stuff and just focusing externally and outside. The real empowerment Mm -hmm. comes from inside, from facing our internal truth and taking responsibility for our life and our choices our choices become our legacy. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So I think I've covered most questions that I want to ask. Is there something that you would like to add or something that I've forgotten? I think one of the most important things for people to remember is to come back to your self-worth because that's one of the things that really gets damaged through abusive situations. We're at this point where people have been worn down so low in their sense of self-worth that they don't even believe they have the right to our most basic human dignity. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so the abuser just takes more and more of your dignity and your human rights. And, and what's happening is an abuse of human rights. That's what's taking place. Your primary mm-hmm. ability to say no, you know, yes. to, to decide what you put in your body and what you do with your body and what happens to your body and not. And so remember to rebuild the self-worth How do we do that? We have to identify our values, what matters to you. And again, that's really been the calling, I think, over the last couple of years is is for all of us to kind of revisit our values and what really matters to us and really take inventory of that. Because once Mm -hmm. you know what matters and what your values are, then you can create boundaries to protect that. And every time you set boundaries to protect what matters to you, your self-worth naturally grows. So that's another important foundation of the healing and something to keep in mind because they're going to keep trying to remind us that we're worthless, that we don't deserve our individual sovereignty, that we need to mm-hmm. sacrifice ourselves for the collective in some way and sacrifice what's okay for us. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's actually interesting. I've been working on an article today and it showed me that the, like our government has a behavioral test on like how to steer behavior of the citizens. And if you read their mindset, then it's like, they talk about the sociological concept bounded rationality. And I'm like, okay, we are not like 100% rational, but do you need to be? You have your emotions, you have your intuition, but it's like, okay, the people are not rational, so we need to determine their behavior. (laughs) And basically, yeah, it's so, uh, it's, it's, it's so, extreme what they're doing but they're not looking at people as independent free individuals um it's it's something like cattle to be managed almost um so yeah so i think that self-worth is really important (laughs) it is so thank you very much for sharing your insights today If people want to find you, I know you have a very popular YouTube channel. You've written a book. So if they want to find you, where should they go? My website is innerintegration.com and they'll find all the links on that website. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.